be seated this morning. As the lights come up, if you'll turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> That's where we'll be today as we get to work and as we start moving in. I'm going to point this a little bit better so it takes some of that glare off for you guys. You're good out there. This, that's on me. Listen, uh, as we get talking today, a couple of things. I want to let you know. First of all, if you had a child up here, let me, let me give you an easy win. If you are a parent or a grandparent that wants to have a conversation about Jesus Christ and confidence with your child, I want you to go home, grab a raw egg, and go outside, and everyone in your family take turns, and you talk about the strength of Jesus Christ to your children. If you don't know how, people say all the time, I don't know how to talk to my children. I don't know how to do this. That's free. Go home and do that. And if you get really brave, hold it over your wife's head. And let me tell you something on the front end. If you have a wedding ring on, or you have it out of the center of your hand, you will take your wife to dinner and buy her something very nice. <laughs> what an awesome thing. Uh, this morning, before we get started, I need to share with you, and we won't over, overwhelm you with it, but this weekend, um, we get to host in a very special way um, some amazing ministry partners of ours. Uh, many of you know uh, Pastor Danny, who uh, is the pastor of Casa Vida in Nosada, and that's one of our partners in ministry here as we try to get the gospel out into the world and make disciples who make disciples of Jesus Christ. And this weekend, um, the pastors of Casa Vida, which Casa Vida um, is is basically right now one church with two locations, so to speak, three. Um, they've come up here to get away and to focus and to meet with some of our leaders and pastors and talk about where God is taking their church in the future and where our partnership is going. And so this morning, I won't make them stand up or anything, but we have um, Pastor Danny from Casa Vida Nasara, but also Pastor Pano and Pastor Alex from Temagrindo and Casa Vida. Would you just guys raise your hands this morning? Would you welcome them? this morning that's good I would let them come up here but with four pastors we wouldn't be out till tomorrow and uh, <laughs> I don't want to do that to you so if you've been in your Bible and you've, you've turned already to Luke chapter 18 here's what I want you to know as we get started this morning we are talking about confidence we're talking about confidence, and in my opinion, there's a lot to learn in Luke chapter 18. Jesus, the depth of his wisdom and riches are so good, but we talked about this last week. Luke does things in an orderly way, and I don't want us to miss this amazing idea that Jesus pushes forward in Luke chapter 18 because we get so excited about focusing on the trees, and some of you know what I'm talking about. Who, who in here wears glasses? Raise your hand. Right? I just got progressives the other day, so I'm going to be doing this the whole time. Let me tell you, the first time I, I received glasses, I went outside and I looked at a tree. And you know what I did? That. Let me tell you what happened. It was standard definition, 1992 tube TV. High definition, 4K. Do you know tree bark has definition to it? Did you know it's got all this great color in it? I didn't know that till I was 30 years old and started wearing my glasses outside. Right? As we look in God's Word, we, I'm telling you today, we're going to take our glasses off a little bit so we don't get distracted by some of the details so that we can see the sea of what God's doing in, in Luke 18, okay? You follow me? And I'm going to put my glasses back on so I can see you as we work through this. Luke chapter 18 talks about confidence. Let me, let me tell you something I did. And this is a story. I don't know if my wife even remembers it. But before we got married, buying a hammock was like heaven. Like our desire was to have a hammock. Do you know hammocks are expensive to newlyweds? Right? When hamburger helper is your side, and Salisbury steak, which is a brilliant idea, it's a hamburger patty with gravy that makes you feel like you're eating real food, right? Right? That's every night. And, and green beans from the can. Because you're with me. Because you just did the math. And you just fed two people for less than $6. Right? That was us. We just thought, it'd be really cool to have a hammock one day. And, and eventually, we bought a hammock. We had a house with trees. And then we moved to a house with no trees. And, and no grass. It was that kind of house. 
and we didn't have a hammock and there was just something in my heart about having a hammock and how that would make my wife happy and well, I didn't really understand my wife and how she worked until later on so I had a brilliant idea it was romantic it was it was incredible I'm gonna put a hammock in our home office and you're gonna walk in and you're gonna feel relaxed because in a hammock aren't you always confident and relaxed no one sits in a hammock during a tornado right like when you're anxious you sit in a hammock when life is good and you're confident let me tell you what I learned about hanging hanging a hammock in your house it better be anchored into something other than just the sheetrock if you ask your wife to lay in it. Can I share that with you? Note to self. A, don't put a hammock in your house. B, hit the stud. Because if it's not anchored into something that you have confidence in, <laughs> you may never have a house with a hammock again. That was 15 years ago. If you come to my house, my daughter has a hammock. Do you know how often my wife sits in that hammock? She doesn't. Right? You have to make sure that your life is secured into something that you can have confidence in. Because if you rest your life into something that appears secure and is not, eventually, it's going to let you down. Eventually, it's going to cause you to fall. Eventually, it's going to cause you to break something. Eventually, it will lead you to a point of pain, discouragement, and destruction. Do you know that's a spiritual concept? It's not, we're not just talking about hammocks today. Do you know as you live life, God wants you to live your life with confidence and you know that but you know how hard it is to live a life confidently everything attacks your confidence if you're not the boss at work the person who has authority over you holds your confidence in your hands it feels like sometimes if you are the boss at work you're even confident less often because you know what relies on you and you know the fallen person you are. In marital strife, if your confidence is in your wife or in your husband, you're going to go through seasons, if you haven't already, where it's going to challenge your confidence because you and your wife are broken. And if your confidence is in each other, I'm telling you, eventually it's going to slip. If it hasn't already or maybe this morning you're in church and you're both on the ground because you're finding out where your confidence was if your confidence is in your physique I want you to hear this 20 something year old who works out every day okay everyone who laughed is not 20 something anymore <laughs> your body will fail you it will fall apart I promise I promise If your mind is your confidence, let me share something with you. It will one day slip. If your character is your confidence, it will let you down. You see, we have to understand, is there something or someone out there that I can anchor myself in? into that will allow me to live the life that scripture calls me to and promises to me this morning luke chapter 18 verse 1 the bible says it this way now he was telling uh, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart this is, this is a beautiful start to chapter 18. Before we get into the parables, before we get into anything else, God says, listen, I want your life to be lived in this confidence. And he gives us the cheat sheet. Prayer is the avenue that's going to get you and me to live a life of confidence. 
This is it. He gives us the whole cheat sheet. If you're a Cliff Notes Sunday morning Christian person, and it's okay, you might, maybe you are, just start here. He says, listen, in the beginning, Jesus says, I want you to show at all times to live a life of prayer, and that living a life of prayer, and that is in communion with God, that you will live life without losing heart, a life of confidence. You won't, you won't give up. You won't quit. You won't be destroyed no matter what the world says to you. You can be a life like the Lord says through Paul. It's in neither height nor depth. There, there'll, be, there'll be nothing, not from above, not from man. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's confidence. It's, it's confidence in his character in the character of the Almighty, in the relationship with the everlasting. You know what's interesting? We know this, but we want to live with a hybrid confidence sometimes, don't we? I mean, since the beginning, in the beginning, the, the Father said, I, with man and woman, I want your whole confidence, your whole self to be found in me in the garden. He, he walked with them in community. What did man do? How do I make it better? And they thought by the actions of men, they can improve upon their relationship with God, and they were wrong and tasted sin. We, we go further. We find Abraham. We find the promised people. What was the whole goal? To have confidence in my relationship with the Almighty. Sinful men in the Old Testament, why did they make idols? Why did they make poles? Why, why did they do sacrifices, even the ones outside of the people of God, so that they could have confidence in their relationship with a creator who is bigger than them? I mean, there's not a storyline in history that doesn't end with saying, I want to have confidence that is beyond myself. It's all pointed. Look, just turn through the pages of Scripture. You can even open like numbers. You haven't even opened numbers in like 12 months, have you? You open numbers and you can see Balaam. And a people saying, come and bless us so we can have confidence against God's people when they come. You see, we're not odd to seek confidence in our life. But what Scripture shows us from the very beginning is that confidence in life comes from what secures your confidence. And that's why Jesus says, I want you at all times to pray and not lose heart. Now that you know the end, we've played Jeopardy and you have the answer before the question. Let's unpack it. Is that all right? Verse 2 down to verse 8. Your Bible says this. Now in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God. He did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring just, about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith on earth? In this big scheme of things, Jesus shows this picture of confidence, and, and he does it by showing us a broken example. If there's an unrighteous judge and the widow has confidence that her persistence will pay off, eventually she'll keep coming at him, will the judge not be good by her? What, what God says is, I'm not a wicked judge. When you and I come to God in prayer, we are not saying, I demand you to bend to my will. Prayer, church, catch it, is not manipulating the Almighty. How silly is that? 
How silly does it sound when we say it out loud that the all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful God of creation can be manipulated by my badgering? That's not prayer. Prayer, Jesus shows us, is you and I confidently trusting in the reputation of the Almighty God that loves us. That's what prayer is. It's saying over and over, every day, every moment, with my life, with my health, with my finances, with my future, with my relationships, with my job, I believe in your relationship so much that I'm going to stay anchored and secured in your power, your reputation, your character in you. That's it. That's what prayer is. That's what Jesus shows us. He's not saying if you badger God long enough, you're going to get that. You know how many people have tried that? Lord, if you would just get me a Porsche, I would get to church on time every week. <laughs> and then, yeah, no, I wouldn't. Right? Kind of go into that. God wants you and I to have a confident, continual relationship with someone that we do not deserve. It's His pleasure. But the question is where we start, will we move towards him or not? Listen to what Ephesians chapter 3 says, verse 1, 11 through 13. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. I mean, Paul's writing this, and he's saying it's not about your circumstances in Jesus Christ, in relationship with him, in communion with him, daily depending on him, through him securing your life in confidence. You can be bold. When the world comes at you, you can be brave. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to be concerned. A little bit earlier, someone asked me the question when I told him that God called me to pastor before he called my wife to be a pastor's wife, and we've shared that story before. What did that year feel like? I wasn't afraid that God wasn't going to call me to pastor. I believed it was his will. Like, I could be anxious over God's time, but that would show I didn't have confidence in him. So just trust him. And a year later, my wife came and said, God's calling me to be a pastor's wife. Confidence is not sourced in the certainty about ourselves. It's sourced in our certainty about the person we're going to all the time. You want to know when you're weakest as a Christian? When you're not in constant communication with your Creator, that's when you're weakest. You want to know when your marriage is weakest? When you're out of touch with your wife? Free. This is free. You want to ruin your marriage? Chase money, never be at home, never be with your children, never call, never email, make your text short, send expensive presents on your birthday but don't share in your relationship. Don't compliment her. Don't listen to her. And surely don't include her in meaningful conversations. That is how, I promise you, if you want to ruin your marriage and be miserable, that's all you got to do. Because you break communion. You break community. Check it. You want to ruin your relationship with the Creator? Just treat Him the same way. And Jesus knows it, so He says, don't do it. You're the loser. You're the loser. So come into communion with him. God's will for the people who left the, the Egypt and the Exodus was not the wandering. That was his discipline. His will was his promise. And they, in their pulling back, in their security in him, 
caused a generation never to experience the joy of the promise of God. You see, what we secure ourselves into is what we're confident in. And community is communication. It's dependence. It's reliability. This morning, what's securing your abiding belief in eternity? Is it Jesus Christ? Let me go a little bit further because Jesus doesn't stop here, so I won't either. 9 through 14. The Bible says it this way. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and he viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and was praying, to, praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay all my tithes, all that I get. Verse 13, but the tax collector standing next, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful on me, the sinner. I tell you this, man went to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted let me let me tell you this church and and you can speak it right but your prayer will give you away the bible says that the pharisee knew the direction of god and he, he unpacks all the things he did all the ways that god could be secure in his faithfulness did you catch that? His prayer was how God, he starts it off, look in your Bible, verse 11, God, I thank you. But the rest of his prayer is how God can be certain that he's faithful. You see, what he says is, I understand what you're saying. But my confidence is in me. My righteousness is in me. When I get to heaven, God, you can be confident to let me in. I fed the poor. I tithed of everything I had. That puts a mo more, you know, ahead of most Christians in America, right? I tithe of all I had. I fast twice a week. Now he separated himself out from most believers in the world. I do all of these things for you. I don't sin. I'm not unfaithful. I'm not a swindler. I'm not unjust. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Church, just because you know the name of the Savior does not mean you have placed your confidence in Him. Do you know what will give it away? Do you know what will shed light on whether you are secure in your confidence in the Almighty or whether you're trying to secure it? It's not whether you come to church or not. It's what comes out of your mouth. Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you don't pray to God, what does your heart think of the Almighty? When you pray to God... Are you proclaiming personal holiness so that the Creator can anchor His trust in you? You see, personal holiness is derived from one place and one place only. Comparing ourselves to those who are more broken than I am. That's where personal holiness comes from. You can't derive it by comparing yourself to the Almighty God. Because if you compare yourself to the Almighty God, go to your Bible, it says this in verse 14, 13, you will say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's nothing. I have no resume. But your friends might say, oh, no, but you do all of these things. No, when I compare myself, when I anchor myself into the Almighty, the Eternal, the crucified Jesus Christ who overcome the grave, 
There is nothing in me that is strong enough to stand. And my prayers cannot be focused on me. My heart cannot believe that in me there's something. Listen, if you find an arrogant Christian, I'm telling you. No, this may hurt. If you are, if you struggle with this, you are not comparing yourself to an almighty God. You believe that your knowledge of the almighty God has given you cred in comparing yourself with personal holiness with the broken. So let me tell you where that ends. Verse 14. The tax collector. I tell you, that man went to his house justified, but the other did not. If your confidence knows Jesus Christ, but is secured in yourself, your hammock is going to fall. And it will catch you off guard. And if it is too late, it will have eternal consequences. Church, with you and with I, we have to have an abiding view of God's holiness or we will turn to ourselves. Listen to what Galatians says in chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. It says this, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision but a new creation. What, what the Lord says through Paul is this, is that everything of me, everything of creation, all of my works, everything that has set me apart is dead dead and hangs on a cross that no one should touch outside the city gates so anything that i boast in verse 14 is found in the cross of our lord jesus christ not in the life of david adams why praise jesus because i can't trust this person because I'm broken. And I will have moments of self-esteem that go over God's plan and self-loathing that goes under God's plan and character that falls short of perfection. You should not rest your hope in me. If you come to church because you like the way that I communicate, stop. Don't anchor your life into mine. Don't anchor it into your husband, into your wife. That's doing the, what the Pharisee did. Anchor it into Jesus Christ. So the first question is, if I want to know if my security is, is resting or what is securing my confidence, the first question is, who do you claim as your anchor? Is it me? You'll know by what depresses you. Or is it the Almighty? But then another question about security is asked because th there's an acknowledgement, right? You and I, if you're in church today, you acknowledge that it has to be in the identity of Jesus Christ. That when we come up against the Almighty, that we fall short, right? We know it. Look at verse 18 to 27. The Bible says it this way. A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Verse 20, You know the commandments, the young men said, or the Jesus says, You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And the young man says, All these things I have kept since my youth. Can you feel it? I have my perfect Sunday school attendance pen. I tithe 12%, Pastor. I love God that much. If someone sits in my seat at church, I don't ask them to move. And I've been this way since I was a kid. Verse 22. 
When Jesus heard this, he said, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess, distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. When he heard these things, he was very sad because he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. For it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, those they who heard it said, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, these things are that are impossible with, excuse me, these things that are, are impossible with people are possible with God. Now, if you need to go back and read verse 24 again, you might need to. Because the young man was sad. And Jesus looked at him and said the following. Have you ever missed that? You ever think that Jesus, after the rich young man, turned his back to him and started teaching to everybody else as the young man went away sad? Luke didn't miss this detail. The young man's going to go away sad, but Jesus looks at him and he said how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, how hard it is for those who God has given much and they have identified, Jesus, you're the one to come to. Jesus, you're the one I'm supposed to pray. Jesus, I get it. I understand it. But abiding is the issue. Because a life that acknowledges Jesus and works for Jesus but holds on to self is on an impossible mission to relationship with him. It's not going to work. If you think that accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior walking to the front one morning will secure your eternity and then you can go do and live however you want to. Let me help you out. You've met Jesus. You may know Jesus. You may think highly of Jesus, but he is not your Lord and your eternity is impossibly doomed. Because when Jesus Christ comes into your life, the word abiding will define your life from there on forward. I'm not telling you you have to be perfect. But if you look around and say, I don't abide in Jesus Christ. Yeah, when I was four, I I went to church and they baptized me. But I haven't walked with him since then. I haven't been abiding with him. I, I haven't been leaning into him. I've been leaning into what I bring to him. I've I brought this to you. I put it before you. And then I left it and walked away. Church, follow Scripture. The evidence of salvation is abiding. That's evidence. You want to be confident, then you want evidence, right? If, if I tell you I want confidence that I am rich, the evidence will be me pulling open the app on my phone in my bank account saying $50 billion, amen? That's evidence. I was rich before I opened the app and was confident, but my confidence to open the app came from what I knew to be true already, that I have in my bank account abiding $50 billion. I do not, but if you're that rich and you don't know what to do, trust me. I mean, can we, you, you feel, follow me. It's seriously, just before we go prosperity gospel, don't do that. But follow me. Follow me on this. Are you confused thinking the fact that you know who Jesus is gives you security and confidence? You know you're a liar if that's true. Because you're not living confidently. You're living broken. You know how I know? Because it's hard to tell someone else about Jesus Christ and what he did for you because you don't want your relationship with them broken because your confidence is in them and not in Jesus Christ. If you know that the God Almighty is above all, you have a conversation with anybody you want to because that conversation is secured in him, not in you. You you want your relationship with your wife? You, You want to know how you treat people at work? If you're living for God at work, let me tell you how it works. When you walk in the room... People, whether they like you or not, know that you love them because the way you speak to them. 
because the way you care for them, by the grace that you show them, because when they fail, it's not an attack against you because your confidence is not in your performance that's being judged by someone else. Your confidence is in Jesus Christ and how you live for him in the workplace. If you want to know if you are living an impossible faith, check your community. Are you communing and securing your faith daily in the Almighty? Or have you acknowledged Jesus Christ and broken away? Jesus says, if that's you, I want to let you know it's impossible. Because confidence that leads to me abides. And you may say, Pastor, I've been here this whole sermon, and all you just did was repeat verse 1 of chapter 18 exactly. Jesus spoke these things to you and to me so that our confidence would be secured by constant prayer that leans into the reputation and the authority of the Almighty that displays our submission to the God of all creation that shows our trust in Him and Jesus saying when you do this you won't lose heart you won't quit you won't get discouraged because it's not secured in you. Church, what would faith be like if that defined the church in Pearland? Scratch that. What would your house be like? Husbands, listen. If that defined the way that you led your home, what would your children look like if their mother and father secured their confidence in them and didn't let their fearful broken secured places of confidence drive their decision making i'm telling you it would change the world not because i said it luke chapter 18 jesus proclaims it all-knowing all-powerful don't trust me trust his word what does confidence look like james read it earlier Verse 31, then Jesus took the 12 disciples aside. And he said, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. And all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Men will be accomplished. I'm confident. Now check this. For he, he's talking about himself, will be handed over to the Gentiles. And will be mocked and will be mistreated and will be spit upon. And after they scourge him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. He said that with confidence before it ever happened. Three days in the tomb, the disciples were beat down and weary. Their confidence had been challenged. On Easter, we celebrate this. Why? Because we are certain that it happened before it happened. Because Jesus abiding in the relationship with the eternal Almighty living, distributing a life of communication and prayer says, I know it, and it's coming, and it's the best future possible. Does that confidence describe you? It can. Jesus says in Scripture, my Father has given all this into my hand, all these. And he's distributed that for you today. Your security, your confidence, your hope, your dream, everything is found in the hand of your Savior. Will you come to him this morning and taste and see how good he is? Will you trust him more than an unrighteous judge? Listen, and today it's not a judge, it's a political riot. If you scream loud enough and long enough, you'll break someone down. If we know that's true about the broken, how about someone who loves you and can't wait to give you what you need? Will you allow your security to be in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Oh, Father, we live in a world that challenges our confidence, and we praise you for that. 
Because I feel like if the broken world around me didn't challenge my confidence, that I would find myself like a rich young ruler, or I would find myself like a Pharisee, believing way too much in me and not abiding in you. So, Father God, this morning, there's some in this room that know you, but have not been abiding in you. And this morning, you reminded them that a relationship that is secured is one that is tied, and it's tied with a hand that cannot be broken. So, Father God, would you allow this morning an admission of brokenness, a belief in Jesus to take one step further to a confession of his role as abiding Lord in their life? so that they could taste the fruit of eternity. Father God, there are believers, just like me in this room, that have been struggling with their confidence because they've been securing it and how other people judge them or how they judge themselves. Lord, would you break that this morning and give them hope and relief? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.